afternoon good to see you all good afternoon sir uh, very warm welcome and welcome uh, i will i'm welcoming you all to this yet another session of in dialogue foundation certificate course in dialogue series 23 24 and my name is muzammil yakub i am currently a policy researcher at iit delhi and i was uh, also uh, a participant in the first the uh, first uh, session of the certificate course in 20 uh, 20 and currently a volunteer within the log foundation today we have the pleasure of having uh, dr shamabartha chaudhary with us and he will be speaking on the topic the infinite addressy some poetic lessons for historical life dr chaudhary is an associate professor at the school of arts and aesthetics jawaharlal nehru university and uh, he has authored books which include uh, theater number and event three studies on the relationship between sovereignty power and truth and has also uh, written articles on ancient greek liturgy the staging of ibsen psychoanalysis nietzsche schiller and hegel uh, i have had the privilege of listening to some of sir's sessions while in jnu uh, so it's really a thought provoking and insightful always to listen to sir and sir we have uh, up to 2 hours for our uh, session with you and we'll have much more time later on uh, for the discussion on questions over to you sir thank you so thank you very much uh, for this invitation i had uh, uh, spoken last year and uh, um, i had uh, had a very very interesting discussion so i look forward to the um to the same sort of experience uh, this time uh, i i uh, remember that i spoke about um, again the fundamental Mm, concern uh, of this um, forum that uh, all of you are part of, uh, which is dialogue, and uh, I had spoken about uh, how we should not look at dialogue and understand dialogue simply as an act of you know transparent communication, uh, moving from the so-called sender of a, a message to the receiver of a message. and instead uh, look at dialogue uh, in a more complicated and um a more uh, a dialectical way really uh so I, had, i had spoken about that but i i had also uh taken my uh, examples and uh, the basic uh, uh, reference points from uh, uh historical um, forms of uh, you know social existence uh, for instance politics and um, other kinds of um, social forms uh this time i want to um talk about the same thing fundamentally which is uh, uh, looking at dialogue not as an act of uh, simple communication uh, but something more complicated and dialectical uh but look at uh, look at uh, the sphere of uh, something like poetry um which of course can be taken in a very general way uh, what poetry is. is and what can be construed or read as poetry is something that can be you know very very wide and um, we can talk about uh, uh, what does poetry mean in in the most general sense a kind of uh, uh, poetics of um, of any kind of uh, composition um which one terms poetry we can talk about that but uh, i want to look at the sphere of poetry instead of looking at the sphere of um, uh, other social discourses for instance politics Uh, in the first place now at the same time what i want to do is to relate um, what i call the lessons from the poetic sphere uh, as we draw them out and how uh, they relate to the other social uh, forms of discourse and interaction including politics uh, but the primary lessons i'd like to draw with some very small examples really uh, are from the sphere of poetry in the largest sense in the in the most indeterminate sense sense in the first place what exactly poetry is is not something that i'm going to really define at this point uh having said that um let's take a look at uh, an initial um paradox in a certain way uh, which is this um, that uh, while we understand dialogue in the ordinary sense in um so to speak um everyday life everyday social life as something which concerns to at least two uh, partners the kind of act of um talking or act of communicating 
which involves two partners. Uh, and we uh, more or less uh, assume that these two partners are engaged in a field um, over which uh, there is a sort of consensus, there is a sort of agreement uh, uh, about what are the rules of the of um, constituting that field, what are the rules of um, engaging in dialogue or in conversation, according to which the conversation proceeds and so on and so forth. In that sense, there is something very uh, conscious and almost contractual about um, the act of uh, um, something like conducting a dialogue in social life. In uh, something like poetry, or if you want literature in general, mm, this is not the case. Uh, there is no such, even if there are readers, listeners uh, to acts of poetry, uh, there is no such initial agreement or initial field of consensus about exactly how to receive a poetic message or a poetic meaning. Unlike uh, the so-called uh, field of uh, uh, dialogue in, a, in, in, in the more everyday sense, in the non-literary sense, where there is such an agreement, if not explicit, at least implicit. Uh, once that agreement is at least implicitly uh, received or understood that uh, agreement is constituted, only then can uh, an, uh, a process of dialogue unfold. This is not the case with uh, something like uh, literature and poetry in particular, where there is as if a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of unilateral um, launching of the poetic discourse, which comes from the side of what we call the poetic, the poet or the author. Uh, who, in a sense, does it uh, uh, makes the address, the poetic address, unilaterally, not really uh, meant to undertake an agreement with any kind of reader, even though clearly an author, a literary author, desires um, a reader and many readers possibly, but uh, does not enter into any sort of a conscious consensual um, agreement or relationship uh, with the reader. And in a sense, literature is, in that sense, a kind of gamble, a kind of wager. Uh, now, the paradox is that why literature, in that sense, is not the typical example of a dialogue in the contractual sense, uh, but at the same time, it is in poetry, particularly in poetry, that you find one essential element of dialogue uh, which is um, which is invoked, which is used most frequently, and which is the form of address, the form of addressing a so-called partner or interlocutor or reader in the mode of the second person pronoun, which is, of course, the word you, or, well, in the slightly more archaic but um, significant uh, English, uh, at least in English language, uh, the significant uh, but archaic word, uh, thou, thou, you or thou. It is in poetry that mostly you find an invocation of the thou or the you. When a poet or in a poem, you again and again read or hear uh, the poem calling out directly to a certain you. And there are several examples of this. I'll take some in the course of this talk. Now, this is a paradox because it is in exactly in dialogue that the most uh, crucial form of address surely is the address to the you, to the other as addressed, uh, you know, literally as you or thou. So this is the point which I would like us to keep in mind in the first place. Again, to summarize, uh, while in non-literary, everyday, so to speak, instrumental utilitarian life, our acts of so-called uh, conducting dialogues have a clear field of application within which we kind of agree to enter into dialogue, which could be based on, you know, uh, solving a problem, or, uh, clearing a confusion and so on and so forth. Uh, in literature, there is a kind of indeterminate space where there is no such agreement and yet literature exists, poetry in particular, but interestingly, it is in poetry that the fundamental structure of a dialogue is the most insistently and 
also sometimes um, in the most uh, transformative, you know, way, beautiful way, aesthetically um, transformative way present, which is the invocation or the address to the thou or the you, which is the basic meaning of dialogue, that you address a you and in a sense try and sustain that address. And also you take the place of the you when you are addressed as you. So you address another as you and you're also addressed by the other as a you, as a you. This in poetry is the most uh, frequently and powerfully present element. And yet it does not fall into the so-called standard uh, um, connotation or under, uh, you know, meaning of what we understand to be dialogue. Uh, so this is the paradox I'd uh, like us to keep in mind in the first, that's my first uh, point. Uh, the related second point is this, that the you in ordinary dialogue non-literary dialogue, is mostly um, well-defined, specified. So we, when we refer to a you, then we understand the reference to be to a particular person or a community or an identity. Uh, and uh, to that extent, uh, this contract can only be possible or this agreement can only be possible when the identities are more or less well marked out. In other words, they can be recognized, even named. So when I speak to you, uh, in this, for instance, what I'm doing now, and I expect some, or I desire some response from you later, then more or less I, I know who I'm addressing in a specified sense, in terms of the forum that I'm addressing at present. You know, and you know more or less uh, the, the person who is addressing you. In this sort of an act of, you know, in real time kind of dialogue proceeding. Uh, so the agreement is clear, even if somewhat implicit. Uh, and then the, the word you or, or the pronoun you can become a little more indeterminate in everyday language or everyday discourse, which is not so instrumental, which is not clearly targeted or, or motivated towards a solving a problem or delivering, you know, like I'm doing now, delivering a kind of um, a, a theme, a theme, a, a theme on which I'm talking. Unlike that sort of a motivation, uh, we can also use the you in a slightly oblique way, but with a, in a way that is actually essential to everyday life. So for instance, uh, in, in the English language, often, when we are trying to make a point and communicate something which we are not being able to do quite clearly. In that sense, there is some difficulty in, for whatever reason, in our act of communication. We usually, I mean, often we use the sort of intermediate, indeterminate phrase, you know, we say this, we speak like this, uh, that I'm not really making a clear statement, but I'm, while trying to make a statement, I'm interposing this short phrase, you know, you know, this is what I'm trying to say. You must understand. Oh, you know. Now, this you know here, the you is absolutely uh, undefined. But the you is functionally very important because the you know already uh, sort of indicates uh, something like a certain kind of uh, a certain kind of request, a certain kind of uh, a, a petition, a kind of pleading that bear with me, bear with me that I'm trying my best to communicate what I'm trying to communicate in everyday life. I'm not being able to do it quite clearly at this point, but I'm trying. So bear with me. And in, in conveying bear with me, I'm kind of saying, you know, though you do not know what I'm trying to say, that's obvious. That's because you're waiting for me to, you know, make my point. Uh, but uh, I still use that little phrase in between and we do it in, idiom, you know, everyday idiomatic sort of use. And I, you know, myself, I'm doing it as I'm speaking about it in that simple but very important oblique sense that I'm asking you to be patient, to wait a little bit for my point as I go along. So these are the two poles of the use of you. One is very well-defined you, where I can be addressing an identity, a forum, a person with a clear identity, and you also reciprocally uh, recognize me in my identity. That could be an individual identity or a community identity or an institutional identity, it doesn't matter. And the other use of you is something which is indeterminate, uh, but indeterminate uh, in such a way that it is a kind of prop. It is a kind of support for discourse not to collapse. 
in the search for something like a dialogical horizon. Unlike these two examples of the you, the particular use of the you and the indeterminate general use of the you, in poetry, the you is both general and extremely, uh, extremely crystalline, extremely sort of well, not well defined, but well articulated. Unlike the you know, that phrase you know, which is not well articulated, it actually stands for a certain difficulty in articulation. Or the other kind of you, where the you is very well defined, that I'm speaking to you, the participants in a particular talk at a particular institution. But in poetry, when we uh, use the second person pronoun, the you, it is both general and at the same time, it is well articulated. So in that sense, poetry gives us a sense of something uh, at the level of language at least, uh, which is uh, relatively difficult to find in everyday instrumental um, conversations and discourses. And that is a kind of rigorous universality, which at the same time is not something abstract. So poetry is both concrete in terms of the usage of the you, usage of the address, and at the same time, it is not empirical. It is concrete, but not particularistic. This, in a way, uh, makes poetry a very interesting uh, form of, in general, uh, human uh, social, um, a form of social interaction or social uh, form of the of of of, of a kind of uh, of a kind of interpersonal um, you know encounter uh, where we encounter each other. Uh, in and through language in a way uh, that is uh, extremely specific, but at the same time is not based on the recognition of identities. So what is that specific thing which brings us together in poetry uh, or which poetry makes possible, uh, which is not the same thing at all as an interest-based conversation. That interest could be uh, of, a, of, a, of a very noble kind, for instance, uh, the, the common interest to solve the problem of, uh, let's say, um, a, a kind of, um, you know, um, inter-religious, inter-communal or communal discord. Between communities, we come together to discuss the problems of communities. The interest is very, very noble, but it's still interest-based. But unlike that sort of interest-based coming together, uh, with poetry, uh, there is a sense of addressing the other, the you, uh, without any such interest, but at the same time, the you is not undefined. The you is somehow, and that is the procedure of poetry in its best, uh, uh, in its in its uh, best versions, where uh, poetry makes the you within poetry itself something extremely, um, extremely um, evocative. You know the sense of the you. But at the same time, you don't really need to recognize that you empirically in terms of, say, corporate identity, uh, communi community identity, even particular identity of the person and person's name and so on and so forth. Uh, this gives uh, the, the, the idea of, uh, or, the, or the question of poetry, a certain sort of space in society, uh, which could be called a relatively protected space a kind of a kind of space uh, which is relatively immunized from historical contingency of identity interest based interactions and so on and so forth yeah. so in that sense we come back to that kind of question of literature and poetry in particular uh, uh, to uh, in the sense of what is its essential relationship to social life or historical life? If it is protected from that sort of uh, contingency and uh, you know immediate uh, variability of social life and interest uh, interest based orientation of social life, then is poetry and uh, literature in general something which is non instrumental and non social and non historical to the point that you can even accuse it or suspect that poetry is then thought of as elitist? <laughs> 
meant only for a small group of so-called people of taste and so on and so forth, uh, that would, of course, totally defeat the point of this kind of universality, you know? But at the same time, that doubt or that slight worry about poetry being a little bit too close to history, a little bit too sort of mixed up with historical life remains. Particularly in a type of society, in a type of historical life that we usually call modern. I'm giving you an example straight away from what we can call the modern context of poetry. And this example is from India. Uh, and the example is about, uh, it concerns a, pers a particular person uh, who in Bengal uh, had uh, in the up to, I mean, even now, in terms of his memory, he still has that reputation. But in his, in his artistic life, from 1940s to 1990s, 80s and 90s, uh, he had a kind of legendary reputation, uh, as uh, not as a poet, but as an actor and theatre director, and particularly as someone who used to recite poetry. And uh, in among other Bengali poets, Tagore's poetry. And that person is called Shambhu Mitra, uh, who arguably, I mean, people would claim he's the greatest theatre actor India has ever seen. Um, but he was also someone uh, who was uh, 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 an absolutely marvelous and unique um, speaker of poetry. Uh, the example I want to take is from one of his later, well, poetic gatherings. Now, the nature of a poetic gathering is very interesting because a poetic gathering is a gathering where someone comes to read poetry and others come to listen to poetry, not for instrumental reasons, obviously not for interest-based reasons, for disinterested aesthetic reasons. So people have come together in this particular gathering, and we have some audio recording of all this, which is my source, uh, where uh, this person called Shambhu Mitra, he, apart from, you know, reciting poetry is also parallelly making some sort of a conversation with the people gathered there. This is probably happening uh, at a public function in Kolkata, in Calcutta, in the 1980s. And what he, to begin with, he says, is quite striking. In the very beginning, he says that if we were in the old times, we could have started out with performing something like a ritual, a rite, which would be a rite or a ritual of purification. We would say that people with uh, petty minds, people with personal interests in their hearts should stay away from this gathering. Let the gods, this is what he's saying, I'm kind of translating. Let the gods protect this space from such people, from such pettiness. Let the gods purify this place. Let the gods stand guard over this place. And then he says, but these days we can't say this. This is quite extraordinary. He actually says it clearly, factually, but with a tinge of regret, if not melancholy. This great, legendary, modern artist of the theater and a reader of poetry starts out by confessing a certain kind of regret or melancholy with the fact that you cannot anymore speak in terms of purification before you enter into the sphere of poetry, which he calls as a sphere. He says poetry is not just any sphere. Poetry is a kind of sphere where the, it, there is a kind of uh, uh, there is a kind of um, rarity, as if the air in, of poetry is rare. It is not common air, and we have to breathe that air, that rare air. But at the same time, he regrets that one cannot speak of this thing anymore in historical modern life because modern life is mixed up. Historical modern life is already too too mixed up. Too many things are sort of you know creating a kind of uh, a kind of 
a medley, kind of cacophony, in which the rare, pure sound of poetry becomes nearly impossible. And at the same time, he says, we are, but we are still gathered here in this so-called modern assembly to listen to poetry. And so he says that, well, nowadays we cannot speak in terms of a rite or ritual of purification for which there are gods to sort of, you know, to, to stand guard over such a ritual. We cannot speak like that anymore. In simple words, it's a kind of secular age. He doesn't use this word, but the meaning is clear. That in a secular age, you cannot speak of ritual in that incantatory sense. But at the same time, we must, as, long, as far as we are part of such a poetic assembly, we must uh, not be like the other historical people. We must not be simply uh, the same as the mixtures of historical peoples. In poetry, we must uh, possess a certain disposition towards poetry, which remains rare. So he uses a different expression, which in itself is quite beautiful. He says, before we come to poetry, we must make ourselves a, 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 a little lighter. So here the metaphor becomes that history is a kind of weight. History is the weight of everyday life, instrumental life, interest-based life. And in poetry, we must become uh, a little freer, a little lighter. In a kind of secularity. Instead of the other idiom, which would invoke some kind of an earlier regime or age of ritual or even religious purification. So even if we can't purify ourselves in the old sense, we must be able to, uh, in some senses, uh, free ourselves from interest or interest-based dispositions. And only then can poetry proceed within historical life. So this example is quite intriguing because it comes both from a modern attitude of recognizing that poetry cannot be completely taken out of historical life, but at the same time, it comes with a certain emotion of the great artist, which is one of a sort of melancholy of an age gone by or going by, age which you cannot hold on to anymore. But there is a melancholy, there is a regret which seems to, you know, uh, which seems to carry you through that passage. And this great Bengali artist from the 19th, mid 20th century, basically, uh, expresses this quite clearly. So this is something I'd like us to keep in mind as I go on uh, to now um, take some examples from historically, that is, in the history of poetry, again in the Indian context, uh, uh, from um, the same sort of question, but asked not through uh, the voice or the, or the performance of, a, of an actual performer of poetry, but through poetry itself. And here I go back even further uh, from mid-20th century to 19th century. And I take examples from two absolutely great, um, you know, poets um, in two different languages, uh, Indian languages, um, Ghalib and uh, Tagore. But what I want to quickly clarify that I, what I'm doing is not a poetic exegesis, nor is it a discussion about the individual poetries of these two great poets. To that extent, I am not uh, doing any kind of technical exercise in poetics, you know, or literature of poetry, or literary, literary study of poetry. So I'm not, for instance, going to talk about the genre of each kind of poem, because after all, for instance, in Urdu poetry, uh, it is not that every kind of poetry is of the same genre. So you have to make a distinction between ghazal and uh, nagma and nazm and sha and many things. Uh, or in Tagore's poetry, the great distinctions of uh, what kind of po poems he wrote at what age of his life. All of those distinctions I'm not really concerned with here. I'm going to straight go to some, some poems or some examples of poetry uh, to look at what I'll call the poetic procedures and how they impinge on or separate from 
historical life, procedures of historical life. So we can just keep these two phrases in mind as the basic axis of comparison, the, the two axes of poetic procedures or poetic operations and historical operations. Uh, but at the same time, I will not uh, give up on the genre that interests me a lot. Uh, not the genre, but the general, you know, the general field which interests me a lot, which is the field of something like performance. So with Ghalib, uh, while Ghalib is from early 19th century, the, you know, the time of Bahadur Shah Zafar, uh, the last Mughal emperor, I will take an example again from mid-20th century, which is a film made on Ghalib. And I think I sent it out um, to the group, but that's all right. Even if you haven't got it or haven't taken a look at it, that's fine. Uh, a film which was made in uh, 1954 by another great um, artist of the cinema, but as well as of the theater, called Sohrab Modi, uh, who made a film on Ghalib, called Mirza Ghalib, uh, in which he didn't act himself. He was such a fantastic actor, but in this film he spoke a commentary, but he didn't act. Uh, the role of Mirza Ghalib is played by another well-known film actor that, of that time, Bharat Bhushan. But the, the, the thing to remember about the, or note about this film is that this film is not really about Ghalib in terms of Ghalib's biography or, you know, the, the itinerary of his, of his poetry, from what kind of poetry moves to what other kind of poetry and so on and so forth. It is really a story. It's a very small but intense love story between Ghalib and another woman, a woman, uh, not his wife, in that sense, a kind of, you know, illegitimate love story, if you want to put it like that, uh, but an intense one between a low-caste Muslim person called Moti Begum, played by the great Suraya. And uh, and uh, this this film is really about the poet Ghalib and Suraya, or Moti Begum, a dome, a dome Muslim uh, woman, who is one of the great singers of Ghalib, performers of Ghalib. Not in the formal sense, not someone who performs in actual performances, you know, public gatherings, but someone who simply sings Ghalib out of her own genius and out of her love for Ghalib's poetry. And then what develops between these two people? This is the story uh, of the entire film. So it is not about Ghalib at all in the larger sense of the intellectual or personal biography of Ghalib. But the story is very clear. Anyway, so I want to just refer to the very first sequence before Moti Begum enters the picture uh, in the film, uh, which uh, is uh, seen in a poetic gathering. So the word poetic gathering keeps, or the, or the phrase poetic gathering keeps coming back. And we will talk about it to, till the very end of this, um, you know, of this discussion. Uh, so this is what is called in Urdu, uh, you know, that tradition, Mushaira, um, Mushaira. So the Mushaira, a poetic gathering, that is under the auspices of the also a great patron and himself a shayar, Bahadur Shah Zafar, the last Mughal emperor. Uh, that is taking place in the court, in the Mushaira, uh, where we have some of the great figures of Urdu poetry of that time, including, for instance, someone called Momin and Bal Mukund, and probably the most reputed senior poet called Zok. And each of them is doing, uh, you know, is reciting poetry or reading poetry or singing their poetry. And then the turn of Ghalib comes, Mirza Ghalib, where Ghalib is a taqallus. It's a kind of, it's a kind of, um, it's a kind of, um, you know, pen name. Uh, anyway, so what is uh, remarkable about this scene is that the entire scene takes place in extremely formal ceremonial style of a mashayara. Uh, where the reputation of each poet precedes the actual performance. So every time the name of a poet is announced, there's great enthusiasm among the crowd, the audience. And even with each line being spoken, and that is the nature of Musharras, that the audience in a way tries anticipating the next line. And when the line turns out to be the one they were anticipating, there is that sort of collective ecstasy and joy and clapping and so on and so forth and what is called Wahawahi. All of that has happened. And one after the other, the, the scene unfolds. And then comes the turn, uh, then comes Ghalib's turn. 
First of all, the way Saurabh Modi, the director, has filmed it is also quite remarkable, quite quite clear and significant, that e each of the others also performs their poetry in a particular stylized way. So either they sing the lines or they speak it in a certain stylized um, sort of a tonality. What happens with Ghalib is that Ghalib starts speaking his lines completely, how should one put it, flat, with a kind of flat, there is no tone, nearly toneless. Of course, no speech can be entirely toneless, but it's almost like a zero degree tonality. When Ghalib is uh, saying his lines, which is really part of a ghazal that he had written the, the night before. And uh, we are, I'm just going to take two lines, I mean, just two or three lines from that ghazal. So he, he starts, and there's a general silence in the court. So no more is can we hear the enthusiastic wahavahi, no more can we hear uh, that sort of anticipation of the great climax of the poem. There is general silence, there's a, almost an you know, utter silence to begin with. And the line that, uh, the main line of that short puzzle part that um, Ghalib speaks out is this. I'll just say it in uh, in the original and then start, sort of roughly translate. Uh, so the line is something, it's in, in, from the middle. The line is something like this. Ya Rab, wo na samjhe hai, na samjhenge meri baat. De aur dil unko so this is the moment that I want to again come back to my main discussion, which is on the you. So it is a form of address. Now clearly it is a kind of love poem, which is addressing some rub, a rub which can be translated as some kind of a god, some sort of a sovereign force, some some force beyond the ordinary sphere of speech and dialogue, but the reference is to Tuvo, which is someone who will never quite understand what I'm saying. Now, for a moment, you might think that this is because uh, the one who will not be understand is inadequate in her capacity or his capacity to understand you. That's one way of looking at the poem. But, what does he say after that? He says, "They are dilun ko jone de muchko zabar." So be, now, the moment you hear dil, which is heart, you immediately understand this is a love poem. So the one who will not be able to understand what I am trying to say is my the one I love, the lover, and she will not be if it's a kind of heterosexual situation with the male galib and the female, so to speak. You know, other. If you just construct it like that, it doesn't have to be constructed like that. But for the moment, if you construct it like that, then the other, the woman, uh, she uh, will not be able to understand. So give her more heart. If you are not able to give me a more articulate tongue. Now, this is really interesting because it seems to show my, uh, my, 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 uh, my self-awareness of how inadequate my own expression is, how badly I'm speaking. So this is the point that I'd like us to remember, that in dialogue, instead of the idea of something like a communication between two equally articulate sort of partners, what happens when each, so to speak, partner is also speaking about himself or herself as inadequate, as not being able to quite say, what he or she seeks to say. So do you give up on the dialogue? Do you sort of admit failure? Or do you just kind of stay with the kind of hope that, oh, uh, you know, some miracle will happen and things will automatically solve themselves? Or do you do something else, which this poem seems to sort of illustrate, uh, which is that you invoke Again, this invocation is, takes us back to that third point, which is another beyond common sphere of historical conversation between two people, even if it's between two lovers. So you invoke. Ya rab wo usko de or dil usko. So you're kind of invoking, you're wishing, you're praying. Yeah. 
but you're praying for something which is not really uh, not really uh, the pure act of the 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 lover of sort of understanding you through some miraculous uh, you know um, spontaneous uh, understanding on the contrary you're saying make her more capable of understanding me even when i'm incapable of making myself understood in other words that's my main point in ghalib there is a kind of hint of something that is quite extraordinary which is on the one hand the admission of the great inadequacy inadequacy even finitude of the speaker the poet has himself or herself and i am only a human speaker with very limited capacity but at the same time within the human sphere itself there is also hope for something more than myself kind of desire and even hopes in infinity of the addressee the one i'm addre- uh, addressing but it is not without the mediation or the reference to some sort of force beyond the human which is uh, ya rab some force beyond so there is a continuous self reflexivity coming back to one's own uh, sort of awareness self awareness about how inadequate one is even as a great poet or as someone who is trying to communicate love but at the same time one is also desiring something at the human level itself which is my lover's capacity to understand much more than i am capable of making understood but of course i'm supported here by the general you know reference to the infinite being the world rub but the last two lines in a way bring that self reference back to one of those delicious delectable pieces of galib's self reference ironic self from the last two lines are just let me just go over the over the entire thing uh so ya rabbuna samjhe hai na samjhenge meri baat de aur dil unko jo na de mujhko zubaan aur hai duniya mein aur bhi sukhanwar bahut acche kehte hain ki galib ka hai andaaz bayan na ya finally we hear galib mentioned as a third person in the third person the meaning basically is uh in the world there are many other poets who are probably capable of speaking much better than me and yet and yet kehte hain it is it, it seems to be sort of the rumor is that galib has a somewhat different way of speaking you see it's very interesting it start with inadequacy there is no claim to having overcome that inadequacy but inadequacy still can embody difference so galib might be inadequate in doing what he seeks to do whether as a lover or, or as a poet that doesn't make galib different from the rest of the great poets and this galib himself self reflexively sort of uh, in the most delicious way delectable way he presents in his poetry kehte hain ki galib ka hai andaaz hai bhai with a question mark this makes the, the idea of dialogue very interesting because dialogue is not any more a transparent act of communication nor is it something uh, which is a simple uh, sort of a miraculous act of communication supported by some infinite being though the infinite being is present in language but here the real possibility of dialogue is with oneself where one becomes the third person i now it's not a question of i and you now i has moved to the third person the great french poet rabo had a sort of great statement or statement in one of his poems i is another i is an other so in a way galib is presenting himself as an other which is galib you know this to me is really uh, the essential modern moment in poetry in the poetic procedure itself but it has a specific uh, a kind of specific dimension which is also a kind of uh um, which is a kind of desire or almost a pleading again a pleading which is to take the reader not any more either as a connoisseur you know the elite who understands urdu poetry or any kind of poetry the elite or painting or any art which only a small elite section understand not take the reader as part of the so called general population that you know generally art will be 
um, something which will be which will which will carry the whole population of a of a region of a country of a society um, uh, sweep them along. No, art is something which actually affirms certain hope in the audience, a hope in the reader as something more than the artist. A kind of a kind of a possible infinity in the audience or in the spectator or in the people or in the lovers of art, which the artist herself is quite incapable of, or at least feels it is incapable of, uh, of, of, um, of, uh, of practicing. Artists' own practice is always finite in terms of language, in terms of expression, in terms of whatever resources. And yet the artist, through those finite resources, can affirm the hope in a larger idea of the people. Who are the readers of poetry here? But at the same time are people who, in that sense, have a capacity more than the artist. But the artist is part of the people, which is a kind of infinite addressee. But infinite addressee as a modern addressee. In that sense, an addressee which is part of history, a historical people, of which the artist herself is a part. And yet in Ghalib's poetry, clearly this infinite addressee is still supported by, at least on the face of it, by some idea of a rub, some idea of, how should one put it, sovereignty. Sovereignty of God, sovereignty of a force beyond the human. So this is my first example that uh, you can keep in mind. Now, uh, uh, let us go to quickly to the second example from a later part of 19th century, uh, which is Tagore, uh, who of course also wrote in the 20th century, uh, a poem, uh, the entire poem um, is called, um, in Bengali, Jibon Debota. Now, the translation of this uh, particular um, title is a little tricky. Uh, literally, it would mean um, life god. Devota is God, not in the monotheistic sense, but Devota is like a, among several gods, a kind of pantheon. Uh, uh, but uh, 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 Jivan Devota is also something which emerges from life. Jivan meaning Jiv, Jiv life, vitality. So uh, let us not get embroiled in the issues of translation right now. Let's see how the title is vindicated to the poem itself. Now the poem is a, is a, quite a poem. Uh, it starts with uh, with an invocation again an invocation in the in the in the second person to the you uh, and uh, through the poem the you uh, is presented or personified by very different figures so for instance uh, it starts with the most general universal invocation of the you as a kind of god a kind of sovereign superior divine force, if you will, uh, to which the speaker, the poet, is again and again asking whether he or she has really been able to, um, uh, able to achieve anything, accomplish anything. So every time the poet speaks, the poet speaks in terms of A, his or her, Life, not poems, poetry straight away, but life. Life, which can be understood as age, you know, youth. Childhood will come to in a moment. Because in Tagore, childhood is very interesting. It has a particular um, pertinence. We'll come to that. But basically, youths or, uh, um, uh, or uh, even, you know, as one grows older, is one able to really, as one grows older in one's sort of biological life, is one able to accomplish anything which is meaningful or which sums up the life, makes the life into a life, a life worth living? And then the, the poet is also invoking one's doubts about oneself as one moves through, for instance, one's, uh, the, the, uh, through the, the course of something beyond human, which is nature, the seasons. So if human beings also experience as if seasons, like nature does. But are those seasons really, have the seasons also expressed themselves with sufficient force? Or, or are the seasons also somewhat lacking in their expression? Is the, is the summer really warm enough? Is the winter uh, really 
uh, um, does it manifest its quality of 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 that of that chill with sufficient force, or is it that even the seasons do not eventually uh, live up to their potential? All this is going on, and in the middle, suddenly the form of address changes from this general form to something which is as sort of a finite figure of the bodhu, of the wife, and in the wife. Again, a kind of heterosexual matrix, maybe like Ghalib's. Uh, the poet seems to uh, seems to uh, plead or not plead, but really uh, confess, expose his or her, his in this case, his failure to his wife, the so-called wife, that he is not able to live up to the question of the true marriage. What would be a true marriage, and then. In the sequence comes that line, which I want to, like the two lines from Ghalib, which I want to really take up with you. And the line is this, from, from the general uh, address to the to something like a god, he suddenly changes the, the persona of the address, the, uh, the address, the addressee, the persona of the addressee becomes a wife. So the, in Bengali, bodhu. Ki dekhi chho bodhu. What are you looking at, um, my wife? Because I'm just not good enough. Again, I'm exposed as inadequate. So in that sense, the reference now is not anymore to the, the larger um, canvas of life or seasons and so on. It becomes the uh, specific moment of a kind of true marriage, which I'm unable to achieve with you, accomplish with you. And then comes the another form of addressal or the addressee. And this is really self-reflexive because Tagore says, uh, the poem says, He ko bhi tumar rochito ragini ami ki gahite pari. What does this mean? It means, now the line is, He ko bhi. Ko bhi is poet. So now the poet is saying, addressing the poet, poetic addressing a figure of the poet. O poet, can I ever sing your tune? or not really tune, can I ever sing or can my tune be adequate to your poem? So now it's entirely self-reflexive. It's actually in the act of poetry itself, again in the locus of this kind of internal exposure to its own weakness. It's, it's continuous avowal or confession that I'm not good enough or I, I only sing badly. And you also notice that now the poet is not the poet anymore. The poet has become something like a like a bard. The bard is in someone who sings or who plays the instrument, a performer. The poet is actually speaking through the voice of the performer instead of directly authorizing himself as the poet. On the contrary, he's saying that the poet is someone else. The poet is an other. And he is not good enough to really speak, uh, to sing at the level of the poem or poetry. The poetry actually becomes a space of this sort of internal difference. The difference between the, the, the so-called sovereignty of the poetry or the poet and the historical actuality, which is always inadequate to the poet, uh, to, the, to the actual poetry of the performer. So in that sense, the performer is not merely a performer as in film actor or theater actor or, you know, painter. The performer is a general figure of the historical agent. Even a poet in historical society can only be a performer. That is Tagore's meaning here, it seems to me. That is. There is no, there is no pure poet in historical society. In historical society, a poet can only even in his own poetry, can only perform badly a, 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 a fragment of true poetry. And yet, the true poetry remains the horizon, a kind of infinite horizon, which again in language is expressed through this form of the addressee, which is the poet. A historical poet or an infinite poet? We are not sure. It is undecidable. But definitely not infinite infinite in the ordinary sense of how we understand the infinite as belonging to a divine sphere, like, for instance, God. Here, the poet is poet, not God. 
Then the last bit of the poem uh, refers to something which is, uh, which is the form of the poetic assembly. So the lines go something like this. Bhingi dao tabe ajikar shabha, anu nabu roop, anu nabu shobha. Now, the last line, the, the kind of towards the last line, uh, there is an abandonment of the poetic assembly. So he's saying, bhingi dao, uh, abandon this poetic assembly. So if you bring back say, the figure from Ghalib, the Mushaira, in a way, that is exactly what happens to the Ghalib. In Sahrab Mullah's film, Ghalib leaves the, leaves the, I didn't mention this, but I should have. What happens is when Ghalib speaks, there is utter silence, and then there is jeering, there is jeering. Okay, what is he saying? We have not come to hear, listen to this sort of vague stuff. This is not giving us the pleasure that the other poets are giving. So Ghalib walks away from the Mushair. In that sense, he abandons the Mushair. And then he meets, on the way, Moti Begum. Who is singing his poems? So there is another assembly, a totally different assembly, you know? Assembly with the singer who sings, who he doesn't know who she is at that point, and also potentially a love. But the truth of his poetry is being expressed so beautifully. But in the official assembly, he turns out to be completely a failure and he leaves it. Now, in Tagore's poem, there is the same sort of thing, but spoken differently. Where there is an invocation again to the failure and a desire to abandon this, this particular assembly, this form of poetic assembly. But there is also, towards the very end, a kind of redemptive desire, uh, which is um, something like this. Brings a new, a kind of new beauty, a new grace. Shobha in Bengali can be grace. A new grace to this sort of an assembly. And then he again uses the same image. Which is, Constitute a new marriage. This is the last bit of the poem. It is quite extraordinary. Tagore says, constitute a new marriage. So it is not a God unless one speaks like a Christian of a certain sort, that it is a kind of mystical marriage. So in kind of sacramental marriage, it's a kind of mystical marriage, no, to Christ. Unless one speaks like that. I'm not so sure we can speak that way when we read Tagore. And yet it cannot be an ordinary marriage either. So the last line is really the desire to, to create a new marriage. And there the poem ends. So the poem goes through this extreme, this extreme sense of failure and abandonment and yet wants to redeem from that very abandonment a kind of new assembly, which is also a new marriage. Now it really depends on, and this is in a way probably also you can say the desire of modern society to both avow its modernity, which is always something inadequate in terms of laying a proper foundation for the, the, the very idea of modernity, which is based on a certain kind of freedom, a certain kind of equality, a certain kind of you know collective happiness. And yet we are not somehow capable of constituting forms of life which make, her ha make us happy, make us free, make us equal to each other, to avow that, that failure. And at the same time, to desire at the level of this sort of a modernity, some transfigured future, which can only be called emancipatory. So in the poem, there is a kind of emancipatory desire at the very end. And yet, like Ghalib, in Ghalib there is a rub, here there is a kind of mystical marriage, which is supporting this kind of a desire. So the you, my point is, the you, which is a, classical element in the idea of dialogue, it is supported in 19th century by something like a sovereign. And that sovereign is never quite human. Sovereign is like a god. That god could come from monotheistic ideas of religion or some other pantheistic, whatever, polytheist. That doesn't matter. But some idea of sovereignty remains. And yet, that sovereignty is not a pure, it's not a ritual sovereignty. 
it, it is not really capable of any more of constituting a pure ritual space, a purified space. That sovereignty somehow has to perform its function in that very element of historical society where poetry is being written by Ghalib, by, uh, by Tagore. And what, what is that element? Really, there is only one element, no? Which is language. So sovereignty also, the sovereignty of God, also becomes a function of something extremely historical, which is language. So in that sense, one of the hypotheses which we could offer towards, you know, this last part of my, my talk, is that uh, language is that which marks a kind of infinity, which is both human, but never in control of any human agent, whether it be the individual agent or a collective agent. The individual agent can be a great poet who otherwise is supposed to be a master of language, but actually language always remains, it slips beyond the mastery of the poet. Or the great, um, you know, desire of the, of the lovers, the love, the lovers, who in the simplest utterances sort of reflect the confidence that they can uh, be adequate to the desire for each other. But even there, they take the support of language. Love itself is an effect of language. Which means there's some otherness, even in that expression of something like uh, pure, pure heart. And then comes the third thing, which is politics, which is a kind of collective desire for emancipation. But in poetry, it seems to still, at least in Tagore and Ghalib, though Ghalib is not talking about politics at all, it seems. In Tagore, it is not politics, and yet something collective is going on. But it's still supported by some kind of uh, imaginary or at least uh, uh, kind of anachronistic figure of the, of the other, which still is personified, though inconsistently, by a kind of god. But the God, like I showed you, or I, 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 I um, presented to you, is continuously interchanged with the, with the wife, with the poet herself. So between transcendence and worldliness or immanence, there is a continuous to and fro. So pure ritual purification can never happen here. And yet history can also not be totally unsupported by some kind of otherness. But that otherness is a function of language, mostly, at least in poetry. Now, having said this, uh, at the very end, uh, I would uh, like us to think uh, a, a little more about, to take the example of Tagore to begin with, uh, about another kind of figure that in Tagore, not in this poem, but in other poems and in, in his general, you know, essays and so on and so forth, but poetry in particular, uh, comes in uh, quite frequently. And that is the child, the figure of the child. And in Tagore, you often find that the space of language is also a space of some sort of pure play, like a child's play. So there it's not a lover's desire. It is not a true marriage. Uh, it is not transcendence. It is something which is the pure pleasure of Combinations, like a child makes random arbitrary combinations with elements, for instance, toys. And again and again, Tagore speaks of in Bengali, Kalaghar, a playhouse, a kind of play space. Once Tagore said that a child is some sort of a hope for God, not for men, but for God. When God sees a child, he is not completely uh, disappointed in human beings. So in Tagore, there is a very interesting vertical kind of a you know schema where you have a child which is at the kind of literally the most uh, uh, sort of um, basic level of the entire construction, where the child is playing around, not even maybe on the on two feet, on four feet, on you know, or sorry, on, uh, uh, still not able to stand straight, but a playful child, and on the other hand the great sovereignty of something like a devota, a god, which is never quite god, which is always a function of an act of addressing, a you, but a you which goes up to that sort of an amplitude or, you know, that sort of scale uh, 
So the scale is the most minor, the child or the playing child, to something as transcendental a horizon as the addressing of a, of a thou. Not a you as much as a thou. But in Ghalib, to me, though Ghalib is more romantic in the in the more you know obvious sense of the word, there is a possibility of thinking of the idea of speech and the addressee in a more political way through those very lines that I uh, you know related to you a moment back. So I'll just repeat the last two lines. Ghalib's signature is something which is unexpected. In that sense, Ghalib is other to the very community of poets, the very idea of a, you know, a regular poetic assembly, which is an assembly of society after all, social individuals, in a king's court or in a mushaira, any poetic assembly. And Ghalib is a kind of exception to that. And yet Ghalib is a historical poet, is a real poet. Then Ghalib actually marks the possibility of a kind of, uh, of a kind of, um, a kind of infinity within one's own self uh, an infinity which one can never quite never quite personify, never quite express, even in language, but an infinity which is something one can, like I started out by saying, one can gamble on. This is a slightly tricky point, a subtle point, but I think we should think about it for a moment. That when you say that I am a failure according to your rules of poetry, your rules of assembly. But at the same time, I claim that in the third person, I carry within me something more than myself, something other than myself. You know, which is the difference, which is the exceptionality to the rule. That in that exceptionality, I don't, which is the kind of aristocracy maybe, I do not merely carry the aristocracy of my own personal sort of, you know, genius or singularity. But I carry the aristocracy of something which is everyone's possibility, which is a general possibility. But it's not a possibility which is immediately visible to us in terms of existing historical possibilities. It is a possibility which is unexpected. It is a possibility which can only come out with a kind of risk that you will be abandoned by the assembly of society. You'll fail in creating a dialogue with society. And yet, you are actually staking everything on a capacity for speech which is far more than the finite limits of dialogue. And that's the infinite dialogue of which one is only a kind of, one is only, as a poet, one is only a kind of, uh, you know, a spark, a gesture, not a personification, not a master. Because then one would be a sort of, you know, a kind of imitative, uh, uh, one would be imitating God. There is no such imitation possible. The idea of God is suspended for a moment. But what is possible in language is to make that otherness of language and the otherness of my own possibilities, in a sense, articulate themselves together as a, as a risky gesture of poetry. And that in Ghalib is something which takes place, though it takes place in this poem simply as a, as a desire for love that let my love or lover understand something which I am not able to speak well, which is the usual desire for any lover. That I'll not be able to speak my heart, but the lover will, will surely have a greater capacity. But translate it now, suppose in a different way, that let my language is finite, inadequate, but can the thoughts of my interlocutors, can the thoughts of my addressees be infinite? Can I risk something on that possibility? And in a way, when Ghalib says, Ghalib ka hai andaze bayar, at the question mark, then in a way, Ghalib is as much the poet as that infinite addressee. And in a way, this opens up something which is a possibility of thinking of collective existence, here through art, merely art, or even love, but uh, uh, which actually uh, opens up 
the possibility of thinking of a people in a different way. A people who are not merely the individual groups of people, identities and interest groups and uh, uh, and, and, and uh, representatives. Though that is also an important sphere of social life, political life, uh, who express themselves, for instance, in elections and so on and so forth, in positions of representation in power and so on and so forth, in a government, in a legislation and so on and so forth. That is all right. But apart from that and beyond that or through that, people have seen, and in a way mathematics uh, helps us understand this quite clearly, People, uh, the French philosopher Ali Badiou talks a lot about this. People are seen in two ways. One is people seen as generic. That is, everyone is people and yet indeterminate. People can't be quite counted. People is not a population. And two, people as always more than its individual selves or individual countable units. In mathematics, this can, of course, be seen in terms of subsets, and I don't want to have to go into that. But in, in intuition of collective life, it can be seen in terms of uh, the fact that people form infinite collectivities, even if the countable people are always finite, whether in the, all over the world or you know, in, a, in a country or in a society. It's always a finite number of people. But in terms of collective subjective possibilities, collective articulation, there are infinite collectivity is possible. Only some of them get expressed in certain kinds of politics that we, you know, know quite well, which is constituted politics, governmental politics, electoral politics, which is absolutely important, but it does not at all saturate the field of something like the thinkability of infinity. In a way, Ghalib's poem, which is a love poem, opens up to something which is not just love, but something which is a people in the infinite sense. So the Ghalib supports his intuition of love with the figure of the rub, with people. Is it necessary or is it required or is it something which keeps coming back as a demand, as a melancholy, as a nostalgia, that it gets supported again by something like the figure of a sovereign? You know? That is a question which we have to really deal with because, or at least, you know, think about today. Because either the people are a possibility beyond their numerical count, or the people eventually need the support of something which is a kind of super, a super people, which can be embodied in a, in a figure, a hero, or a, you know, a, a, a governmental figure, a particular figure of authority. The question is an open one, but it is something that I think collectively uh, we should uh, we should uh, think about. So let me end here, and uh, I'll be very happy with any kind of um, discussion and questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you so much sir, for this enlightening session. It's always a pleasure to hear from you. So uh, the session is now open to questions from the participants, but as a moderator, I would take the liberty to just initiate the conversation. And I would want to draw your attention to the uh, line that provoked, kind of stimulated my interest uh, more in the debate, was when you used Ghalib's poetry as, uh, no, first of all, when you kind of drew the complexities and intricacies in the usage of you in poetry and literature. I was trying to relate that to the uh, concept of infinite addresses as you uh, talked about. So a few things that I would want to highlight and bring to your consideration. For example, uh, the usage of you as a first person, uh, used as a first person pronoun, the second, as, as a second person is like very well articulated by you. I was also thinking about it like in a more nuanced manner. Uh, when, for example, uh, Bahadur Shah Zafar says, you talked about him as well. So he writes in one of his guzzles, for example, Kitna hai bad naseeb zafar kabar ke liye. Kitna hai bad naseeb zafar kabar ke liye do gazza mein bhi na mili kuwe yaar mein. 
so zafar kind of using this poetic sense to address to himself kitna badnaseeb hai zafar right and similarly we talked about the sovereign as well and iqbal uh, kind of referring to uh, muhammad iqbal yeah so he also uh, kind of employing that sen- that sovereign sense in his po- poetry yeah. and variously referring to the concept of god in his uh, terms and uh, he writes that uh, kitn uh, sorry uh, agar hangama hai shok se hai lamaka khali lamaka is the other world that we talk about so agar hangama hai shok se hai lamaka khali khata kiski hai yaar ab lamaka tera hai ya mera so again invoking the sense of god and then trying trying to understand the complexities of this world hmm. so i was thinking along these lines i mean how variously has this you been used employed by these poets right correct galib using it very differently than how uh, iqbal and zafar u- use it and also i mean one interesting uh, share from galib's collection is uh, we talked about uh, the share where he kind of inflates his sense of uh, poetic sense that aur bhi sukhanwar hain duniya mein bahut acche but galib ka andaaz e bayan hai aur he also at another instant kind of uh, writes that rekhte ki tum hi ustad nahi ho galib so you are not like alone the property here of this whole collection of this uh, of the language called rekhta kehte hain ki agle zamane mein koi meer bhi tha here in here referring to meer the king yeah, yeah. right so i mean all of these put forth those complexities in the usage of you i was trying to understand the symptoms of dialogue and the infinite addressy of you so in this broader kind of a spectrum of poetics and the usages of these uh, nouns and pronouns mm-hmm. can we uh, also understand the role or the significance of intimacy mm-hmm. or the symbolism that is kind of impacted or that's carried upon carried uh, mm-hmm. in the sense of you in general literature and especially in poetry i mean how is that symbolism how is that intimacy impacted when we bring this you to kind of use it in different connotations in different contexts so i mean like the, very yeah, incoherent but no 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 it's very nice what you what you ask and actually it's not a question you actually supplemented what i have said with so many rich um, rich points uh so for instance uh, the question of intimacy is really really important uh you know in religion this intimacy is encountered with sometimes very surprisingly because otherwise religion is generally seen as very doctrinaire or something very commanding but in the bible in the hebrew bible uh, um, uh jesus in his crucifixion suddenly addresses uh, the father god the father with in the hebrew intimate um, personal address uh, of the you abba abba you know in the hebrew bible it's not a father in the formal sense in the sense of a formal relationship in the hebrew it's actually the way say baba or yeah uh, abba uh, so it it becomes a case of absolute particularity of intimacy and in the moment which then becomes uh, interpretable or understood as jesus going through something as personal as suffering in the body of you know of one of oneself in the most physical corporeal sense and it is and in that sense remembering in that closest sort of a, a invocation of um, the most intimate uh, which is a parental sort of a relationship intimately and 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 invoking the father in that intimate sense of the personal uh, pronoun you abba uh, and at the same time in that very moment getting transfigured as the founding figure of a new religion which is christianity you know so it's, it's also a kind of transition from judaism literally from hebrew to to the christian sort of sphere uh, so these sorts of things have happened in religion which are unexpected but enormous again let me use the word operations linguistic operations now the examples that you take are fantastic uh, uh, with zafar it's one kind of operation with ghalib though it appears similar because ghalib is speaking with the third person but it's another kind of operation and both have a certain sort of um a certain sort of effect of intimacy uh, but in uh, in ghalib uh, 
uh, that intimacy uh, is actually something which always, um, and that's why Ghalib is also often seen as a figure of humor, uh, is always uh, somehow uh, produced or constituted through an internal distance, to a kind of distance, a distance between the first and the third person, but contained in that very figure. With uh, Zafar, possibly that distance actually closes down and we actually feel, the, in the, even in the third person, the pathos of Zafar, of Zafar's fate. But with Ghalib, there's always a kind of distance which is always also a structure of humor. In all of Ghalib's, you know, otherwise extremely um, sort of uh, torture, I mean, complicated, sometimes tortured, sometimes, um, uh, sometimes lacerated, um, sometimes ecstatic emotions, personal emotions. And yet in the structure of poetry in Ghalib, there is a kind of uh, internal distance uh, which is created in that figure, in that very, very name, uh, Ghalib, as a takhallus, as a third person. So that is a very interesting point about intimacy, which again I'm kind of trying and uh, trying indicating is a kind of modern is a is a modern operation, which avows the impossibility and the failure to constitute something which is a, like a fundamental kind of foundation for all those ideas that we speak of uh, with a sense of fundamental value. You know, say freedom, equality, happiness, collective happiness. We speak of them with. Uh, fundamental with a sense of fundamental uh, indispensable value but at the same time we cannot constitute them uh, with any kind of mastery because for that constitution we need a god but the moment a god comes in in that in that sort of religious sense at least in the religious sense maybe god as a as an other can be can be kept um, you know is thinkable uh, or at least kept uh, in, in our in our discussion. But God as a figure, the moment God as a figure comes, you know, whatever sort, monotheistic or polytheistic, there is a heteronomy. Then you cannot consistently then speak of freedom, equality, and collective health. God is not equal to us by definition, and God is, how, in terms of emotional dictation, God can have arbitrary choices for us. There is no guarantee that God is, necessary. God is uh, obliged to make us happy. You know, uh, so, but we cannot constitute these ideas uh, f within finite uh, circumstances through clear, um, you know, mastery over our political forms, over our social forms, because we always get them wrong or badly. Does that mean we abandon giving up, give up those ideas? Surely that is would be a disaster. If we do it, maybe there's always a danger that we give up on these fundamental ideas. But if you do it, according to me, and I'm sure many of you would agree, it would be a disaster. It would be a disaster. So the real challenge is to not give up on these ideas and yet uh, somehow stake something on an infinity which we are not capable of, but we are capable of encountering, not capable of in the sense of some kind of a property we possess. You know, like God has the property of being infinite. We are not, we don't have a property of being infinite, but we're capable of encountering infinity. Poetry, possibly, and some poet examples of poetry, including Ghalib or Tagore, or surely other poems, are examples of that encounter. That is what I was trying to bring out. So thanks for that uh, set of those sets of set of remarks. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, so the participants can go ahead and if you raise their hands. Question to the chat box. I won't be able to read my, I have a severe visual difficulty. So someone has to read I, I will do that. If there is I anything in the chat box, yeah, yeah. Sure. Please, Tolika, you can go ahead. Go ahead, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. First of all, uh, thank you so much for the session. Uh, it was quite interesting. I have a few questions. I would start with the first one. So when we talk about uh, interpretations, Basically, the domain where, uh, where the writer or the poet meets the the reader. So, wouldn't the message that has been that ha that the poet uh, has been trying to propagate have another meaning to what is being accepted universally? First question. 
Mm -hmm. So second question, there is a famous uh, philosopher, and this is a little hypothetical question, but it uh, popped it popped up in my mind, so I would just uh, like to give it a go. So you must have heard about Plato, how he calls mm -hmm. poets the the thugs, basically mm -hmm. the the ones who are spreading misinformation and are uh, somehow corrupting the youth's mind, mm -hmm. and they don't even deserve to live in the idle state. Mm -hmm. So had uh, had he been alive uh, in the defense of poets, what would have been your take? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so another thing, uh, what I have observed is when when I try to put my emotions into words, mm -hmm. I somehow feel that I am doing uh, injustice to those emotions because the most abstract thoughts, what I believe, cannot be put. And I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. I am open for criticism. So when we try to put our abstract thoughts into words, there, there, there's this injustice done to the emotion. Mm -hmm. And the entire essence of poetry seems to be how a poet is connected to the emotion, to mm -hmm. whatever particular thing, and he's trying to put it into words. Yeah. So, and, and even in the session, how you said how seasons don't live up to their expectations, maybe the poet even do, even does the same, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so there's this another thing. Uh, uh, this is just an observation too. Why is there always, in most of the poems, there's a heterosexual matrix? Mm -hmm. uh, don't you think the, 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 the entire thing needs to be changed and need, needs to be universalized in some way, which is which is supposed to be meant for everyone. Right. And, uh, and, and sir, uh, do you think this is a first order uh, inquiry or form of thinking, or is it a second order form of thinking? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Tulika. Uh, there are many questions. I don't know if I'll be able to address all of them properly. Uh, uh, so what was the first, I couldn't quite understand your first question. Can you just uh, repeat that part, the first one? Sir, uh, it was basically about the interpretation, the domain mm -hmm. where the the where the reader meets the poet. So there's it, usually what we see even when I read about the the readings uh, mm -hmm. that you had sent us. Mm -hmm. So there's supposedly one universal meaning to to the poem or maybe mm -hmm. to the phrases in the poem. So mm -hmm. uh, don't you think the the mindset or the thought process that a poet had? while he was writing it, could be different from what is universally accepted, right, what the yeah. meaning. Yeah. Of course, yeah, I understand now. Okay, thank you. So, all right, the first uh, first question. So, you're completely right. I send those readings and they have those kind of word for word or sort of sentence by sentence paraphrase. So, those are only paraphrases. Uh, and in fact, uh, I had written to, uh, uh, you know, the organizers that I could, uh, I would want to redo the translations, Tagore's poem in particular, but I didn't have the time to do that. Uh, so you're completely right. The readers will always um, have um, different ways of uh, paraphrasing or rewriting a poem or rearranging a poem or poem's meaning. And uh, the writer herself uh, would uh, have meant something which would probably never be a unilateral or uh, univocal meaning, a clear meaning. In poetry, surely there is something which I've already indicated, a kind of undecidability of uh, which meaning to go for. And in a way, poetry is probably the unique experience of that undecidability directly being part of our experience of reading. Because uh, uh, ambiguity and contradictory meanings and so on and so forth uh, are, are part of the total experience of poetry, uh, which in the case of the other kind of discourse, which I started out with, interest-based discourse, where you want to solve problems, would really create a huge bottleneck. Because if you are confronted with ambiguity at every point, you'd really uh, be, it's very difficult to go ahead. You need to, you need to you know, relatively uh, have unambiguous paths to take as far as meaning is concerned. Uh, vis a -vis discourse, but in poetry, one can actually experience something which is ambiguity directly in language. So, kind of clarity of ambiguity itself. Uh, so, you're totally right. Uh, when we when we send out uh, these uh, meaning based, this is just to help you to get some indicators, just an indicator. 
so uh, when I when I was looking at the Bengali and even the the, the translation of the Urdu, Ghalib, often I was not satisfied. But then what I'm satisfied by, you might not be satisfied with. So this is an infinite process itself. And in a way, what Ghalib says is quite extraordinary. And I go by that as a motto. That eventually it is like asking for the reader's capacity to be infinite. Writer still uses a finite resource, which is language. Some trace of the materiality of language remains there, no? In any kind of discourse, including poetic discourse. But with the reader, something else is possible, which is even, I mean, it is, you, so let me jump to the last question, last part of your question. That is quite amazing, very important. That uh, eventually, is it that we uh, have to, in poetry, we kind of still be, um, still be, you know, tied to the finitude of language. Eventually, even language is a finite resource. Even if meaning is not determined by very clear possibilities, it's it's more than that, but still it's finite. That's why I did mention uh, briefly mathematics or, you know, knowledge, which is not really of the poetic order. And one of the, one of the ways of thinking infinity clearly but abstractly is mathematics. Now, this brings us to Plato. You know, Plato was someone who uh, was a, is always a fascinating figure. Why? Because on the one hand, officially, he favored philosophy and mathematics. Philosophy is the ultimate sort of kind of wisdom, but mathematics is closest to it because mathematics gives a clear objective model for through knowledge towards wisdom, while poetry goes in the other, other direction. But poetry gives you a subjective seduction or a kind of uh, an experience of seduction which makes us feel that we are masters of many knowledges, but actually it is a delusion. It is a seduction. But that's the thing. Plato is quite, quite um, fascinating because he also expresses or embodies or emits the very symptoms of that seduction. If it is seduction, as Plato himself says, he is the one who keeps manifesting symptoms of that seduction because he keeps going back to the poets. Homer. Mostly Homer, but other poets. He keeps going back to them. And mythologies. But of course, he tries to make them didactic. So one of the things that we need to study with great seriousness is the other thing, not between merely philosophy and poetry, that great quarrel between philosophy and poetry, uh, and the place of something like science in all of this. But also the function of teaching, because Plato is someone who speaks through the teacher, Socrates as teacher. And what is teaching? Can poetry ever be a teaching? Or can poetry only be transmitting something directly? In that sense, Poetry is very close to mathematics. You can't really teach mathematics. You can kind of transmit mathematics through its procedures. You can't have a kind of equivalent of mathematics, which is like a picture of mathematics. You know, you can teach the procedures of mathematics. With social sciences, for instance, you can have a picture of social sciences. So, for instance, if I want to uh, explain society, say caste, then I can draw out for you a picture of what caste might be, say, gradation, like a made credit. But it's only a picture to help you to, to learn the, uh, the meaning of caste through a particular picture. And there can be other pictures. So uh, poetry and mathematics are very close to each other. And there, Plato is, in a sense, complicated because he's attracted to both. So both are directly transmitted. They have a direct capture or a direct sort of effect, unlike other knowledges, particularly what we call social science knowledges, which seem to move quite, quite frequently through schematization, through examples, through laying out of a kind of, of intermediate pictures. You know? So I think in, with, with regard to Plato, uh, the question of teaching, because he, after all, Socrates is a kind of teacher, uh, but there, is there only one kind of teaching? 
the institutional teaching that, for instance, we practice in universities and institutions of knowledge? Or is there another kind of teaching, uh, which is a kind of direct teaching, which poetry and mathematics seem to be uh, more sort of close to? And what is then the figure of the philosopher? Plato brings all these questions out, not directly, but as symptoms. Uh, that to me is very interesting about Plato. Uh, there was another question which I have forgotten. If you want to remind me? You... Sorry? Yes, sir. I'd like to. Yeah. Uh, sir, by the way, very impressive answer on Plato. Sir, uh, when we try to put our emotions into words, uh, yeah. don't you? Yeah. yeah. Don't you no, think? No, so you that's the thing, no? You're right to ask that question. Uh, emotions into words. And then there is, a, there is a kind of inadequacy. That's again and again what the poet is saying. Uh, the poet is saying that I'm doing this badly. I'm doing this badly. Uh, but at the same time, this is the only thing I can do, which is to speak through words or speak words. Uh, so there are two ways of going about it. Heidegger, the great German philosopher, in a way, made that very finitude a transition to a kind of what he called poetic saying. The poetic saying of being. Yeah. The other way of looking at it is that it is not the poetic saying which is the sort of the uh, the final uh, sort of arbiter of any possibility of saying truth or being of emotion of anything. Uh, in that sense, there even even poetry is something which can open up uh, to 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 some other sort of uh, possibility. Uh, which is not based on the uh, contingency of language. Uh, and that again takes us towards um, either the extreme, uh, sorry, the abstract but clear possibility of something like scientific knowledge, including that of mathematics, or it takes us to something uh, which is what you're trying to get at, it seems to me, emotions, uh, which uh, then should be thought of, I suppose, as as uh, something like uh, as, as something like uh, the the um, the uh, gesture of uh, uh, the gestures that 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 are uh, that are organized or that are um, localized in something like the efficacy or capacities of the body. So this is something which has happened uh, in a lot of thought. And it, can literature, in a sense, be close to the body or is literature an abstraction from the body? You know, uh, uh, one is not very, uh, one is not entirely certain that the two can be completely separated or that the two can be completely identified. Uh, so there, uh, something which in the 20th century and even now has, um, um, drawn a lot of attention, which is to speak of literature as a, as a way of uh, of uh, articulating or resonating with the capacities and affects of the body. Because if there are emotions, then these emotions must have a localization. And the body can be the general topos of the, you know, the, the locus of that, uh, or, the, or the space of that localization. Can literature, in a sense, be, uh, and poetry equally, uh, be uh, a, a kind of, a, a, a kind of, um, not a reflection, because that would be a second order, like the, la the other question you put, that would be second order, uh, but a kind of articulation of the body. This is an open question, because after all, with body, we are talking of one kind of, one kind of being, and with language, we're talking of, with poet, or with literature, we're talking of another kind of being, which is of language. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the two can't also be totally mechanically separated. Uh, so this, this, this to me is a difficult question, which I can only try and um, discuss with you uh, uh, and at the same time leave, leave open. So yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so we have more questions from the participants. I would request you to be like reflect on them briefly because sure. we are running short of time, 15 more minutes. Punam, I would request yeah, okay. you to okay. go ahead with the questions. Yeah. 
హలో గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ సార్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఎవ్రీ వన్ ఐఎమ్ పూనమ్ ఐఎమ్ పిఎస్డి స్కాలర్ అండ్ డూయింగ్ పిఎస్డి ఇన్ ఇకనామిక్స్ ఫ్రమ్ సెంటర్ ఫర్ ఇకనామిక్ స్టడీస్ అండ్ ప్లానింగ్ జవహర్ లాల్ నెహ్రూ యూనివర్సిటీ థ్యాంక్ యూ సో మచ్ ఫస్ట్ ఆఫ్ ఆల్ ఫర్ సచ్ అన్ సైట్ఫుల్ అండ్ ఇన్ లైట్నింగ్ లెక్చర్ ఐ ఫైండ్ ఇట్ వెరీ ఇంట్రెస్టింగ్ ఐ హ్యావ్ రెడ్ లైక్ గాలివ్ అండ్ టెగోర్ ఇన్ లైక్ దేర్ పోయమ్ ఇన్ పీసెస్ నాట్ ఇన్ మచ్ డెప్ but your lecture inspired me to read them uh, like in depth and i find it very interesting the way like you explained uh, giving example of both their poetries how like um, so there is accepting acceptance of uh, one's own limit and also seeking that uh, the desire through the something some, the divine power which is uh, uh, which is bigger than the self Mm-hmm. like in galis poetry he addresses that uh, praying to the rab and in uh, tagore he is like surrendering that, that to mystic marriage mm-hmm. and i find it very interesting and sir could you uh, like uh, in in like in the beginning you explained that poetry is place which is protected and humanity humanized from identities so mm-hmm. what makes poetry different than like non literate literature uh, subjects and non literature uh, literary things like is it like uh, kind of poetry is something like is speaking from the heart like uh, addressing uh, uh, like addressing um, issues like which is emotion like the thing is context might be different but emotion like feeling are the same like for example source of fear can be different but the fear like feeling of fear is the same so right. is it that which uh, like you know universalized and make it common uh, right. like inclusive poetry and second thing one uh, at one point of time in, in your talk you you explained that historical uh, poet and infinite poet so can you explain that in detail thank you Uh, thank you very much so uh, again these are very important uh, questions uh, i can only address them briefly uh, so uh, i mean the initial part you kind of responded to what i said and thank you for that uh, now on 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 this point of um something uh, which is uh, in the nature of uh, 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 poetry as addressing emotions yeah you're right poetry could be addressing emotions in the in the sense of something which is fundamental and universally universally um in uh, universally present uh within within the world or society experience of in existence of human experience uh uh without really entering the so called scientific or narrative context which is the point you made correctly that it doesn't have have to ask the question of what caused which are the circumstances in that sense poetry has a kind of uh, has a kind of passing movement passes through uh, the the point that i was trying to raise was is this passing through itself already a complication of poetry or a kind of a kind of um endangerment to poetry according to a certain uh, view of poetry which takes this poetry as a sort of pure expression uh, of uh, language uh, which is uh, crystalline transparent to emotions so what you'll find is uh, one sort of thinking which thinks of uh, poetry as a kind of like i cited heidegger who would say that poetry is a is a pure saying it's a poetic saying poetry in that sense is tautological poetry is poetic and poetic is a kind of saying and what is poetic saying it is the saying of poetry so you keep moving in circles but these circles are not uh, these are not uh, my these are not trivial circles these circles actually express the essence of poetry which is to say something which is truth Uh, without truth becoming propositional without truth becoming a matter of say mathematics or demonstration poetry in that sense is a kind of i shouldn't put it is a kind of monstration not a demonstration but a monstration a direct say you know uh so so that is one way of thinking about uh poetry 
the other way of thinking about poetry is poetry is actually symptoms. Poetry makes language into a kind of phosphorescence. You know, language shines with not meaning but its effects. So, like the body, sort of in symptoms, symptoms of joy or symptoms of pain. The body is not anymore uh, something which has uh, an anatomy and a physiology. The body is a surface of manifestation, feeling, emotion. The word you used, and the other question, you know, the last question also about that emotion. In that sense, poetry is like, in the sense, poetry is the equivalent in language of body. Put it simply, poetry is the kind of body of language, language becoming body, because it becomes a pure surface of effects. So that is also way. In that sense, it's anti-conversation. Uh, in insofar as conversation means like I started out by saying, a finite game of meaning with some specific interests in mind. Now, interests should not be taken badly or negatively. Interests can be extremely important, extremely uh, not selfish necessarily. In interests can also be collective. So collectively, we want to solve our social problems. Well, so many things, I can say, take so many examples, but let's not take examples. You can all think of examples. Interest is not a bad thing or a selfish thing necessarily in the sense of individual selfishness. At the same time, interest is finite because interests will change it's because circumstances will change. You know, uh, poetry in that sense is not a function of circumstances. At the same time, poetry does work with a material which is language, which has its own historicity. So that's why to read. Tagore's poetry and Ghalib's poetry is also to engage with the historicity of these languages, Bengali language, Urdu, or even Hindustani. And each of them both has a history, you know, uh, which changes, but also a politics. And we could go deep into the question of politics of Hindustani as reflected not just in poetry, but also in popular culture, including cinema in India. Uh, from early 20th century up to the present. We could do that. Uh, all of these things are possible. But all of that would still be interest-based. So, For instance, if there could be interest in, which I, I, for instance, would like to be part of that interest group, to, to preserve or protect or enrich Hindustani, which is a kind of mixture of many things. And then there could be interest group in poetry, which could say, no, poetry must become pure, uh, uh, purified of any mixture. In that sense, there should be kind of a pure Urdu poetry or pure, uh, you know, other kind of Hindi poetry, which is Sanskritic. Whatever be your view, these are interest-based to preserve a particular view of poetry or preserve another view of poetry. The other thing is poetry itself. The poet, I doubt any poet works with the interest of protecting or representing or promoting one view of poetry or another. It's the other way around. It's because there is a poem by Tagore, by Ghalib, by, I mean, we can take so many other poets, uh, even today's you know, present-day poets, that these views can get consolidated and debates can happen, which are more than poetic debates. They are historical debates, political debates, cultural debates, and they can be quite violent debates. We know that. But poetry itself is not really directly concerned in the immediate sense with these debates, insofar as these debates are interest-based. In this meaning of interest, not selfish interest, but interest as finite preoccupation with promoting a cause, solving a problem, consolidating a view, and so on. That is what I was trying to bring up. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Do we have more questions from the participants? Can you please raise your hands? We have five more minutes. Sure, sure, sure. I believe there are no questions anymore. So yeah, that brings us to the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor, for such a thought-provoking and enlightening session. It's always a treat to hear from you. Thank you. And thanks to all the participants who joined and to the guests as well and Tain Dialogue Foundation for providing us with this platform to join and connect and share our thoughts. I thank you all and wishing you a really 
great evening ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you for your attention and the invitation.